Hello, welcome to Lesson 25 in our study of denominational doctrines. You know, when you read the Bible, God is trying to show us how that we are to live. He's trying to show us how we can get ourselves out of the sin problem we got ourselves into. He's trying to show us the way to heaven. And friends, it is not right for you and me to take our views, our doctrines, our concepts, and try to say, look, I know you said this, Lord, but we're going to take these things over what you have authorized. When we do that, we involve ourselves in vain living, vain worship. In vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Mark 7, 7. You know, the Bible also teaches that God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. John 4, verse number 24. You know, the Bible also says in Hebrews 10, 25, that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now, if I'm supposed to meet, if I'm supposed to worship God in spirit and in truth, and if there's certain things that I really need to do, such as partake of the Lord's Supper, Acts 20, verse number 7, give, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, then surely there is a time, a day, upon which all of this is to be done. And so, in this lesson, we want to talk about false doctrines concerning worship again, and especially as it relates to to the day of worship. The Lord's day or the Sabbath, which? You know, you have people argue back and forth. Well, you're supposed to meet on the Sabbath. No, you're supposed to meet on the Lord's day. Well, which way is it? No, you're supposed to meet over here on Saturday. No, it's the first day of the week. Again, we asked, which way is it? I remember one time Eddie Craft invited me to teach a Bible study. And, of course, I went. He said, there won't be anybody there, basically, but members of the Lord's church. We're just studying the Bible together. Come and teach it. So I was on vacation, so I thought, well, I'll teach it. So we went down to the place, the home, where we were supposed to meet. And sure enough, a good crowd had turned out. And before we could ever get started, a young man, who we did not know, had showed up for the study, and that was great. But a young man started pressing us on worshiping on the Sabbath. He said, you're wrong even about the day of worship. And we said, well, what do you mean? He said, you're supposed to worship on the Sabbath. And I said, okay, let's talk about that for a moment since you want to discuss it. If I wanted to worship on the Sabbath, what would I do? I said, listen. You claim that the ceremonial law has been nailed to the cross. See, they make a distinction, as we'll see later in our study. But you claim the Ten Commandments are still binding. Number four says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Tell me what you would do to remember the Sabbath. So, well, I don't know. I, <clears throat> I could go walking in the woods and think about God. I said, well, now... That sounds good, to go walking in the woods and think about God. But where in the Bible would I read where that's involved in keeping the Sabbath? Now, friends, when you read the New Testament, you'll find out that we have a day upon which we are indeed to worship. The first day of the week, Acts 20, verse 7, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. When you read the Old Testament, You'll see, indeed, they had a day upon which they were to worship. And that was the Sabbath, as per Exodus chapter 20. But like I, I, like I asked him, what am I supposed to do on the Sabbath if it's still binding? But see, it's not binding because that was part of the Old Testament law that was nailed to the cross. Not only that, as we'll see later, it was given to the Jews only. Never was given to me never was given to you. We never have been, Gentiles, under a God-given obligation <clears throat> to observe it to start with. Now, 
Let me read you something that I believe you will find of interest. This is from the Adventist. What is the change of the Sabbath but the sign or mark of the authority of the Roman church? The mark of the beast. Now think about that. Here you got the Adventist telling you and me that if we do not observe the Sabbath, that we are going along with the Roman Catholic Church, thus we're taking their mark, the mark of the beast. Well, now friends, I'm here to tell you the Roman Catholic Church is not the one that came up with worshiping on the first day of the week. Because the Bible teaches we are to worship on the first day of the week. Acts 20, verse number 7, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. When I was at the Memphis School of Preaching in Memphis, Tennessee, I had a Bible study with a Seventh-day Adventist preacher. And I asked him, I said, now, Bill, I want you to be honest. I want you to tell me the truth. And I want you to give me a Bible answer. Not what you think about it. If I partake of the Lord's Supper on the day prescribed by the New Testament, what day would it be? And he said, well, that would have to be the first day of the week. I said, exactly. I said, now, if I give on the day that the New Testament says I'm to give on, what day would that be? He said, well, that'd be uh, the first day of the week. I said, all right, now, what I want you to do is give me Bible authority where anybody ever partook of the Lord's Supper on Saturday. That's what he was calling the Sabbath. Or anyone gave on Saturday as authorized by the New Testament. He looked at me and said, I can't give you that information. I said, I know you can't give me that information, but yet you teach I've got to worship on Saturday, on what you call the Sabbath. You say, I've got to observe that when that law was never given to me. It was given to the Jews. Deuteronomy 5, 1 through 6. Now how in the world can you bind that on me when it was never bound on me to start with? And not only that, even if it was, it was nailed to Calvary's cross when Jesus died on the cross. Now, you know what they do? They come to Genesis 2, and beginning with verse number 1, and they try to say this, is when the Sabbath was given. Let me read you those verses. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God had created and made. So what the Sabbatarians say is this, can you not see that God Almighty sanctified the Sabbath from Genesis 2 forward? No, that's not what these verses are telling us at all. Keep in mind that Moses wrote Genesis 2 some 2,500 years after creation, he, looking back, is telling the children of Israel why the Sabbath was sanctified. Not when, but the why. Why, God, did you sanctify it? Because upon that day I rested. Not that God was tired, just that he had finished, completed that which he had done. So then, that was going to be symbolic of what he wanted Israel to do. How that they too were to take the seventh day, and they were to rest and to worship God upon that day. Now, when we come to Exodus 16, beginning with verse number 22, this is the first time the word Sabbath occurs. It is the first time any details is given given about honoring the Sabbath. And then when you come to Exodus 20, 
8 through 11, we have the Ten Commandments given upon Mount Sinai, and we have the Sabbath given as a commandment. Now, folks, I know when the Sabbath was given. I'm not speculating. I know. And the reason I know is because God made a comment on it. In Nehemiah 9, beginning with verse number 13, listen to what the Word of God said. Thou camest down also upon Mount Sinai, and spakest with them from heaven, and gavest them right judgments and true laws, good statutes and commandments. Now watch. And madest known unto them thy holy Sabbath. Do what, Nehemiah? God came down upon Mount Sinai. He gave them laws. He gave them statutes. He gave them good commandments. And he made known unto them the Holy Sabbath. So then I know when the Holy Sabbath was made known. Because a prophet in the Old Testament has commented upon the subject. Now notice the Sabbath was given solely to the Jews, not to Gentiles. When one reads Deuteronomy 5, <clears throat> beginning with verse 2, The Lord our God made a covenant with us in Horeb. The Lord made not this covenant with our fathers, but with us, even us, who are all of us here alive this day. Now wait a minute. Moses, what are you saying? God made this covenant with us. He didn't make it with our fathers. It wasn't with Adam and Eve. It wasn't with Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. But he made it with us, even us, who are alive this day. Now, that being true, and it is, then I know the Sabbath was not a command that was obeyed by Adam and Eve. I know that because, number one, the law was given to the Jews. Number two, Nehemiah said it was made known on Mount Sinai. Notice, if you will, what Exodus 31, beginning with verse number 13, says. Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep. Ye who? Children of Israel. For it is a sign between me, God, and you, Israel. Now, the Sabbath was not a sign between God and all nations. It was a, Sabbath, it was a sign between uh, God and the children of Israel. That's what the Sabbath was for. Throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord, that does sanctify you. Ye shall keep the Sabbath, therefore... For it is holy unto you, everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. Now, when you think about the patriarchal age, no Sabbath, no penalty if you violated it because it did not exist. When you think about the Christian age, no Sabbath, no penalty if you violate it. But when you think about the mosaical age, you've got a Sabbath, and you have a penalty if you violate it. You'll be put to death. So he's, here he says, those who defile it will be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me, now watch, and the children of Israel forever. Now, friends, used to I'd wear a wedding band before my hands got a little too fat for it. Don't wear it now because my ring's too small. But when I had it on, that wedding band, it was a sign between me and all women. No, absolutely not. 
It was a sign between me and one woman, my wife. And it, to it told all other women, this man is taken. He is off limits. Well, when it comes to the Sabbath, it was a sign not between God and all nations. It was a sign between God and the children of Israel. And when you read Exodus 31, 13 through 17, friends, it is so simple to understand. I've read this to Sabbatarians. I have begged them to explain this to me. If I misunderstand, explain it. God says he's making the Sabbath a covenant between him and Israel, not him and all nations. How did you come up with it was a sign between God and America, or God and Russia, or God and China, or God and whatever? No, it's God and Israel. That's the agreement. Now, the Ten Commandments and the Sabbath are no longer binding. I know this because a new covenant was promised in Jeremiah 31, beginning with verse number 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And on it goes to declare that. Then when I take the New Testament, I start reading it. I come over to Hebrews 8, and I see the fulfillment of this. How that that new covenant has been given. And how that God no longer holds anybody accountable to the law of Moses. But all men everywhere are amenable to the teachings of the New Testament. Now, when you look at Hebrews 10, 1 through 4, you learn some things about the Old Testament that it was not sufficient. The blood of bulls and goats could not remit sins. It could not make the comers thereunto have a good conscience. But thanks be... To God Almighty that he sent his son to be a sacrifice for you and me. He's given us a new law that we might serve God through this new law. You might say, are you telling me the law has been changed? That's what I'm telling you. You might say, well, have you got proof for that? You better believe I got proof for it. Listen to the word of God. Hebrews 7, verse number 12, For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. The Bible says the law has been changed. You might say, well, what happened to the old law? Well, the old law was nailed to Calvary's cross. Well, have you got proof for that? Yes, the Bible teaches clearly in Colossians 2, verse number 14, that the old law was nailed to Calvary's cross. And when we read Ephesians 2, 12 through 16, we find out that God is now trying to take both Jew and Gentile and unite us together in one place, and that one place is in Christ, not in Moses, not in the law of Moses, but in Jesus Christ. Listen to these verses, Ephesians 2 verse 12, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes afar off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and broken down the middle wall of petition between us. The Old Testament and Judaism was the middle wall of petition between Jew and Gentile. Now it has been broken down, and both Jew and Gentile can be joined together in Christ Jesus. That's the importance of the new law. That's the importance of realizing which law you and I are under. The Bible teaches the principle in Romans 7, verses 1 through 4, that if you and I try to keep both laws, we commit spiritual adultery. Well, we don't want to be guilty of spiritual adultery. So then we've got to make sure we understand which law that you and I are to give credence to. Well, what are the arguments then of the Sabbatarians? If they're going to keep the Sabbath, surely they have some reason for it. Let's look at some of their arguments that they make and answer them. Number one, they say, well, Christ kept the Sabbath. And if it was good enough for Jesus... It is good enough for me. Sure, he kept the Sabbath. 
Keep in mind, he lived, he died under Old Testament law. Listen to Galatians 4.4. 4. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law. Notice, Jesus Christ was born under the law. He was subject to the law of Moses. Yes, he kept the Sabbath, but he kept the Passover. He kept Pentecost. He kept all the feast days. Are you going to endorse those as well? Are you going to keep those? We asked those who are Sabbatarians, why not keep these other things? Oh, but they were nailed to the cross. They were part of the ceremonial law. We'll get to that in a moment. The Bible does not make that division as they so declare. Argument number two. Why do the Sabbatarians say we ought to keep the Sabbath? They say there is a distinction between the law of God and the law of Moses. Now, <clears throat> let me show you why they got to do that. See, they don't want to come along and say all of the Old Testament is still binding. Because if they make that argument, then they're going to have to say that animal sacrifices are still intact. See, they don't want to make that argument. They do not want to burn incense. They don't want the three feast days. They don't want those things. So how do they get rid of part of it and keep part of it? They say, well, the law of Moses was simply all those ceremonial things that people had to do, while the law of God was comprised basically of the Ten Commandments. They'll say it's true the law of Moses was nailed to the cross, but not the law of God. Now with that in mind, let us notice some principles. And I want you to notice how the Word of God uses the law of Moses, the law of the Lord, interchangeably in the Bible. In Nehemiah 8, verse number 1, And all the people gathered themselves together as one man into the street, and was before the water gate, and they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses. All right? Want to hear the law of Moses? Which the Lord had commanded to Israel. Notice the law of Moses are the commandments of the Lord. These are the commandments that he had given. In Nehemiah 10, 29, they clave to their brethren, their nobles, and entered into a curse and into an oath to walk in God's law, which was given by Moses. Now, God's law is said to be given by Moses, but Moses' law is said to be the law of God. Can you not see they're used interchangeably? The law of God and the law of Moses were one and the same law. You mean to tell me that Moses came up with a law and God had a law? No, the only law that Moses could have was the law that God gave him. That's the only law. Now, when you come to the New Testament, I didn't put a lot of these down, but there's several of them. You'll have uh, in one place, and here's the beauty of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You'll have in one place where the Bible says the law of Moses said, and you'll have in another place where it says the law of God said. Showing the law of Moses and the law of God are one and the same. Let me give you an illustration. In Luke 2, 24, And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord. A pair of turtle doves are two pigeons. Well, now wait a minute. Here you've got the law of the Lord dealing with animal sacrifices, and the Sabbatarians say, no, that's the law of Moses. Well, sure enough, when you turn back to Leviticus 12, verse 8, it is the law of Moses, which proves the law of Moses and the law of the Lord is simply one and the same law. Now, <clears throat> we might ask again, why do the Sabbatarians teach that one ought to keep the Sabbath? Well, they come up with another argument. They say, well, the New Testament commands the Sabbath to be observed. Because it says in Hebrews 4, verses 8 and 9, For if Jesus, speaking of Joshua, had given them rest, then would he not have afterwards spoken of another day. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. They take this rest to mean the Sabbath rest. This is talking about heaven. This is talking about one's eternal rest. And by the way, 
how can they say that he spoke of another day when Joshua would have been under the Sabbath given what they say? But see, they're wrong on the point. Well, another argument they make, they say, well, Paul preached on the Sabbath. Sure he did. Paul often went to the synagogues. And I've got verses down here that declare that. In Acts 13, 14, But when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Pisidia, and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Sat down and taught them. Now, they might say, Wesley, do you believe Paul went to the synagogue on the Sabbath? Absolutely. But I'll say this, he went there because that's where the people were. He didn't go there to try to participate in their worship because he no longer believed that Old Testament worship was binding on people. He believed in New Testament Christianity. He went there because they would afford him an audience. He could speak, and he tried to encourage them to come out of what they were in. I have often spoken on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday myself. But that does not mean that I'm trying to say these are the days that the Lord has appointed for worship. Listen, there are some things you can only do upon the first day of the week because God chose that, not me. And so then, yes, Paul, he often did things on the Sabbath just like he did other days. But that does not mean that he is trying to honor that as the day of worship. Then notice, if you will, they say, well, if the Sabbath command is no longer binding on men, then all of the other commandments are gone too. What do they mean all of the other commandments are gone? Well, see, number four of the Ten Commandments says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. They'll say, well, if you don't like number four, then what about number five? Honor thy father and thy mother. Or number six, thou shalt not kill. Or number seven, thou shalt not commit adultery. So what you're saying is, you're saying it's all right to do all those ungodly things. No, that's not what we're saying. We're saying there's some principles that are eternal because they're moral principles. For instance, before the Ten Commandments were given, when Cain killed Abel, it was wrong. But the Ten Commandments had not been given at Mount Sinai yet, but it was still wrong because that is an eternal principle that it's wrong to kill. Well, when you look in the patriarchal age, you got these moral principles. When you look in the Mosaical age, you got these moral principles. When you look in the Christian age, you got these moral principles. But when you go back over to the patriarchal age, you don't have the Sabbath. It was made known at Mount Sinai, Nehemiah 9, 13 and 14. Over here in the New Testament, you don't have the Sabbath because it was not binding. We have the first day of the week. Acts 20, verse 7, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Now let me show you that these other nine moral principles are found in the New Testament. See, they say, well, if you're going to do away, do away with the Sabbath, then you're going to say and have to teach that adultery is okay. No, that's not what we're teaching at all. Notice, it, uh, the New Testament teaches, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Acts 14, 15. That one is not to make images. 1 Corinthians 5, 21. You're not to take the Lord's name in vain. James 5, 12. Remember the Sabbath? Not a verse in the New Testament anywhere that authorizes that. Honor thy father and thy mother, Ephesians 6, 1. Thou shalt not kill, 1 Peter 4, 15. Thou shalt not commit adultery, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10. Thou shalt not steal, Ephesians 4, 28. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, Colossians 3, 9. Thou shalt not covet, Ephesians 5, 3. And these are just a few verses that deal with these principles. But I'll tell you what you will not find, as I've already mentioned. You will not find where the Apostle Paul or any other inspired man said, Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. It's not in the New Testament. But go back to the Old, and you'll find that, because that was part of Judaism. Well, notice then, here's another argument they make. Christians are taught to obey the Ten Commandments by James. Because James says you're supposed to keep all of them or be guilty or of all of them if you break just one. In James 2.10, For whosoever shall keep the whole law 
and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all? Here's something you need to know about Sabbatarians. Every time they see the word commandment in the New Testament, or commandments, plural, they understand that to be talking about the Ten Commandments. That's basically the way they reason. If the Bible says that one is to keep the commandments of God, if you love me, keep my commandments. They say, well, see there it says keep his commandments. What are his commandments? You know the Ten Commandments. Well, there's more commandments than the Ten. And not only that, the Ten were nailed to the cross. Now, by the way, folks, we don't keep any of the Ten Commandments found in Exodus 20 because they're the Ten Commandments. We obey these moral principles because they're found in the New Testament. None of the Old Testament is binding upon us today. No, James wasn't trying to say, look, you've got to keep the Old Testament. He's talking about New Testament law. How do you know that? James 1.25, But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. James was trying to promote the perfect law of liberty, not the Old Testament law. And that's what some would have you and me to believe, but that's not the truth. Well, another argument that they make, they say, well, the Sabbath was changed to Sunday by the fallible authority of man, namely an edict by the Emperor Constantine around A.D. 321. Now, here's what's amazing. I was studying with two Sabbatarians one time, and they had some world books and various uh, writings and they brought him in and said, now look here, I want you to see who changed the Sabbath. It wasn't God, it was man. And they read some kind of statement that said Constantine did it. Then they gave me another one that said the Roman Catholic Church did it. Then they gave me another one that said someone else did it. And I said, well now you need to make up your mind who did it. Who changed it? Who changed the Sabbath to the first day of the week? Well, I'm here to tell you it wasn't the Roman Catholic Church. I'm here to tell you that it wasn't Constantine or any other uninspired man. I'm here to tell you that the Bible says the disciples came together on the first day of the week, Acts 20, verse number 7, to break bread. Also, they came together on the first day of the week to give, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Constantine, did you give us those verses? Not at all. The Roman Catholic Church, did you give us those verses? Not at all. Notice we do those things because God Almighty authorizes us to meet on the first day of the week. Not some uninspired man. Well, they come along and they say this. The Sabbath is an everlasting covenant. Therefore, there's no way in the world that you can be justified if you ignore it. And sure enough, if you read Exodus 31, 13 through 17, these verses tell us that the Sabbath is a perpetual covenant. There's no way around that. The Bible says that. But then it qualifies that statement by saying throughout your generations. Speaking to the children of Israel. In other words, as long as God recognizes the children of Israel as being his people, then they will be under a God-given obligation to worship God on the Sabbath. But he no longer recognizes them. The old law was nailed to the cross. Well, now, if we're going to talk about perpetual covenants and those things that are ordinances that go on and on, let's read some more here. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. Ye shall keep it a feast by, by an ordinance forever. Now, forever, folks, is a pretty long time. Here we're talking about the Passover. God is saying, keep the feast forever. What feast? The Passover. Now, if we've got to keep the Sabbath because it was a perpetual covenant, We've got to keep the Passover because it was to be done forever. But then again, it's qualified throughout your generations. Then in Exodus 30, verse number 8, 
when Aaron lighted the lamps at even, he shall burn incense upon it, a perpetual incense. Now we've got to burn incense because they are said to be perpetual as well. And I've got other sacrifices and so forth here that are said to be perpetual or forever. And if their argument is true, then all of these things still stand. But let's talk about the beauty of the Lord's Day for just a moment. Why the Lord's Day? Well, because it's taught in the New Testament. But what is its significance? Well, number one, the Lord himself was raised on the first day of the week. When we read Mark 16, 9, now when Jesus was raised early, the first day of the week. Our Lord came forth from the grave on the first day of the week. That's why it's special to you. That's why it's special to me. Then notice another point. It was the day on which he appeared to his disciples by many infallible proofs. Read John 20, verse 19, and also verse number 26. Then notice the church began on Pentecost, and Pentecost always fell on the first day of the week. So then the church had its origin on the first day of the week. Read Leviticus 23, verse 11, verse 15, and then go and read Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit came on the first day of the week. Acts 2, 1 through 4. Then I want you to notice that forgiveness of sins was proclaimed for the first time in the sweet name of Jesus Christ on the first day of the week. Luke 24, 47 through 49. Then notice the contribution is to be taken up on the first day of the week, according to 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. The Lord's Supper is to be had and partaken of on the first day of the week, Acts 20 and verse number 7. And then notice John was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day, Revelation 1 and verse number 10. Friends, can you not see it is true? Under the Old Testament law, they were to remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. But under New Testament law, we are to come together on the first day of the week to worship God in spirit and in truth. Now, I mentioned in an earlier study, if one understood the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament, these problems would go away. If one just understood the old law was to the Jews and has been nailed to the cross and never was to any Gentile and that the new law is for all men everywhere, then we wouldn't have any trouble understanding these things. Go forth, help the Sabbatarians see the truth on this very important subject. And may God bless you as you do that.